Try it again. Okay. That's not fair. I'm supposed to follow that. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and from the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. There are two main symbols, or three main symbols, in the communion services we celebrated as Seventh day Adventists. There are the basin and the towel for foot washing. And of course, there is the bread and the wine. But today we're going to look at another symbol from the communion service when Jesus gave it and instituted it. It's not a main symbol, but it's an important one. So I want you to listen as Luke 22, 14 to 20 is read to catch what was there, what took place when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper for us. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. I want you to notice, Jesus told the disciples that he earnestly desired to eat the Passover with them. And that he would not eat about again until he comes again. So the communion service points forward to the second coming, Right? But that's not the symbol we're going to look at. I would like to say, however, that I think Jesus earnestly desires to be present with us through his spirit as we take part in this communion service today. He is anxious to join with us in this very special event. But that's not the overlooked symbol I want to look at. I want you to notice it says in verse 14, when the hour came, he reclined at table. He reclined at table. Well, we look at that phrase as simply a physical description of what took place. There was a table there, Passover meal was on it, and he reclined at table. But I believe that there is a spiritual description as well that the table throughout the Bible has spiritual meaning, that the table is used as a spiritual metaphor for things God wants to, to do in our lives and for us and through us. And it's that that we're going to look at this morning, that the table itself is an overlooked symbol as we take part in communion. The first place I want to point you to is the table of showbread in the Old Testament. The table of showbread was relatively small, but it was very valuable. It was overlaid with gold. It was only three feet long, 18 inches in depth, and only two and a half feet high. The priests would have to literally bend over to use the table. It was a symbol of God's presence. It was a symbol of God being there with and for his people. And on that table, according to Leviticus 24, was the showbread. And the showbread was six loaves of bread, probably round, on one side and six on the other. And it was a symbol of God's provision for God's people. And the priests 
Aaron and his sons were the only ones who could eat the table of the showbread from that table. And they'd replace it every single Sabbath. And it was to remind them that, that they were living by God's provision. And through them, God was providing spiritually to the Israelites. And ultimately, the, the showbread was a symbol of Jesus himself, who is the bread of life. And so the first thing we want to look at at the table is it reminds us of God's presence and God's provision and the fact that Jesus is the one who sustains us physically. It's also a symbol of family. Notice Psalm 128.3 the promise that your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. I think one of the few blessings of COVID was that people discovered or rediscovered the importance of eating together as a family. There have been those who have surmised that not only are people eating out less because maybe the, the cost of eating out is higher, but people also rediscovered the importance of sitting around a table together and eating and talking about their dare and day and sharing insights and sharing what took place. And so the table reminds us it's a symbol of family. And as the church, we are part of God's family, right? And so we gather today to gather around the table, as it were, as part of the family of God. The table is also a symbol of friendship and fellowship. John 12, 1 to 2 tells us and reminds us of what took place in, in Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave him dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one who was reclining with him at table. The table is a reminder of fellowship and friendship. What's it like when you sit around a table with friends and you enjoy a meal together? Do you, do you remember how often Jesus did ministry around food? Frequently. Why? Because when we sit together around a table, there's a fellowship that takes place that doesn't take place anywhere else. I find it interesting that in the message to Laodicea in Revelation 3.20, Jesus used eating, and though a table is not mentioned, I think it's implied. He said, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. Usually when we read that, we think of it being personal, that Jesus is knocking at the door, and we've seen pictures of Jesus knocking at the door of a person's heart. But if you stop and think about it, the sad thing about that statement is this was a letter written to what? A person or to a church? To a church. And Jesus is saying, I'm standing at the door of the church asking for entrance into the church, his body. But the good news is he doesn't say it takes the whole church to allow me to come in. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with them, which implies that he will also dine with all those who are there if they allow him to. This table is a reminder that Jesus wants to enter into our church, and he wants to be the focus of our church, and he wants to have fellowship with each one of us, and he wants to have fellowship with us together. That's not all. In the Bible, the table is a symbol of acceptance and honor. I don't know how many of you have studied the story of uh, Mephibosheth. He's not a well-known Bible character, but he is an important one. He was the son of Jonathan. And when his father Jonathan and his grandfather Saul were killed in battle, the nurse in those days, if a king died, there could be a fight and the family could be destroyed, any, any uh, descendants. And so his nurse picked him up and as they were going down the steps of the palace, she dropped him and he became lame. Years, many years passed. And one day David's sitting in his palace and he remembers the promise he made to Jonathan that if anything happened to Jonathan, he would take care of his descendants. So he called his advisors together and he said, is there anyone still living from the house of Saul to whom I can show honor for Jonathan's sake? 
And Ziba, one of his counselors, says, yes, there is a, a, a lad, Mephibosheth, but he's, he's crippled. And to be crippled in that, that society meant that you were an outcast. And he said, bring him here. And he brought him there and he told him, I'm going to give you all the land of Saul back to you. And not only that, I'm going to provide food for, for all of your family and any descendants of Saul. And not only that, every day you will sit with me at my table. And David fulfilled that promise. Every day there was Mephibosheth, crippled, sitting at the table with the king, eating the best of food, listening in on the king's conversation recognizing he didn't deserve to be there, but he was there because the king asked him to come. This morning, the king of the universe has accepted you and I, and he has said, please come to my table. Come to my table and, and celebrate my goodness and celebrate the fact that I have invited you here, and I've invited you here so that we could have fellowship with one another. This table is a reminder that we're invited to be in God's presence. The table in the Bible is also a symbol of peace and reconciliation. Psalm 23, 5. That famous psalm, David wrote, You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint, honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing. Many commentators try to figure out what it meant that you set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Some have tried to discount it and say that can't be literally. It must mean that the enemies are vanquished. And so by setting a table before me, the enemies look on and, and are jealous and, and it, it rebukes them for, for being enemy of God. I don't think that's it at all. For you see in the Bible times, if you had an enemy and your enemy was there and you were eating you were expected to invite them in and provide protection for even your enemy at that time in hopes that as you ate together at a table, the issues between you could be resolved. This morning, this table reminds us that God has provided the means for us to have peace and be reconciled to him and to each other. The table's also a symbol of joy and celebration. And I'm not going to read the passage, it's up there, but you remember the story of the, the prodigal father, known more commonly as the prodigal son. When the son comes back home, the father says, look, my son who is lost is found. Let's set, I want to make a feast, kill the fatted calf. I want you to come, and, and my son was dead and he's now alive. And they began to celebrate the fact that this lost son had returned home. The Lord's Supper is to be a celebration. I want to pause here and just give you a suggestion. So many times when I lead out in communion services, especially when we get to the time where we share the emblems, I look out and I see people with the most somber faces in the world. In fact, they're almost downright sad. And yes, this is a solemn occasion, but you can have a solemn occasion that's happy too. I, I, I want to, to, to share with you the idea that when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're to do so with gratitude and thanksgiving and, yes, even joy. I, I want to share one of my favorite statements from Ellen White on the Lord's Supper. She says, The communion service is not to be a season of souring. This is not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather about his table, they are not to remember and lament their shortcomings. They are not to dwell upon their past religious experience, whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They are not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. The preparatory or the foot washing service has embraced all this. The self-examination, the confession of sin, the reconciling of differences has all been done. Now they come to meet with Christ. They are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. Let that soak in. When we celebrate communion, we are not standing in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. We have every reason to celebrate with joy and thanksgiving 
and gratitude. But that's not all. There is one more symbol. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of the promise of heaven, a symbol of eternal life. Remember the story of the centurion? Jesus said that in all of Israel, no one had faith like him because he said, you don't have to go and see my son. All you've got to do is say the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus said, I've not seen such faith in Israel. You will sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and you will enter into the feast that will be prepared there in heaven. Remember the story, what's told to us in Revelation 19, 6-9, that there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb to which we will all be invited. And we've already seen in, in the story of the institution of the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter, chapter 21, we already saw, or 22, we already saw that Jesus said he would not eat of the fruit again until he comes again in his kingdom. And so, as we look at this table today, as we are here gathered around the table, if you will, I would remind you that this table is a symbol of God's presence and provision made possible by the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's a symbol of family, both our, our own immediate family and the family of God as a church made possible by the blood and body of Jesus. That this table is a symbol of friendship and fellowship made possible by the bread and blood of Jesus. That this, symbol is a, this table is a symbol of acceptance and honor made possible by the blood and bread of Jesus and body of Jesus. That this table is a symbol of peace and reconciliation made possible by the body and blood of Jesus. That it's a symbol of joy and celebration made possible by the body and blood of Jesus. And that this table is a symbol of eternal life made possible by the body and the blood of Jesus, our Savior. It's a practice in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that we do something called foot washing. And foot washing is a, an, a, a, we call it an ordinance or a ritual or a rite in which we participate with one another by washing another person's feet and then washing ours as a twofold symbol. Number one, it's a symbol of our willingness to be servants to others. And number two is a reminder that we need to be cleansed from our sins. And then we'll come back and we will eat the Lord's Supper together.